All right. Um, welcome back. Is there any question that you may have in mind? Just anything unclear? <coughs> any, anything that I may have not mentioned enough or explained in detail with respect to the first hour? Or any suggestions? Everything's fine? Clearly understood? All right. And also you t took note of this possible final exam question, right? Well, it, it can come in different forms. Okay, so pay attention to the differences between uh, the model protocol and the additional protocol and why it is important to have Iran ratify the additional protocol, for instance, or any country, not only Iran. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, these are available on the website of the IAEA and also available in hard copies in my office. So maybe I should have uh, brought copies. Actually, these are, the model protocol is called the Blue Book. It is a tiny blue book, booklet, and the additional protocol is thicker because it uh, incorporates many more elements in, in much more detail. So both of them are blue. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, information circulars in CERC. These are uh, intra-institutional, um, intra-agency um, sort of codification system, information circle of 153 and 540. So these are available on the website. And if you just Google um, model protocol, IAEA, something like that with keywords, you will most possibly get a PDF or the text of the um, model protocol and edition protocol. Actually, having mentioned this much, the edition <coughs> protocol, I would like to emphasize something that I uh, emphasized back in the late 1990s before Turkey ratified it, signed and ratified in 2001. The edition protocol <laughs> is significant because it allows the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors to carry out inspections by visiting any facility that they would, they would consider would be, would be important for having an idea as to whether there is anything wrong, anything suspicious about the activities of that particular country. So, Actually, the, uh, the summary of what I said was the IAEA has now the authority, authority to go and visit any facility they believe it is important for them. Well, of course, it's not in such a straightforward manner, but it comes down to this point. Because in the text of the additional protocol, if I'm not mistaken, it is Article 5. There, there are these uh, paragraphs, Article 5, Paragraph A, B, this and that, or 1, 2, with small italics. Um, it says, if, well, the IAEA will visit facilities, and there is, of course, a part at the end of the document uh, defining what exactly it is meant by certain terms such as facility. So a facility is something that, that houses, that incorporates such and such amount of such and such nuclear or related material. So there is all these the definitions about uh, what kind of facilities might be of interest to the IAEA. But there is at some point in Article 5, Paragraph B, I mean, I just very obliquely remember from my report, my letter that I wrote to the Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs by my own initiative, not just because it was asked, but I took my academic and citizenship responsibility and wrote that letter. It says, any other facility other than, other than the ones mentioned above, which literally means anything. Because um, when this document uh, was started to be actually prepared back in 1993 under the name of program 
92 plus 2. It was a study that was envisaged to start in 1993 and finish in 1995, but it took a little bit longer. And in 96, 97, the study uh, was still being carried on. And if I'm not mistaken, it was in March 1998, I attended a <coughs> conference. And in that conference, there was a person who was in charge of this study, this document. And this document was distributed for the first time for our uh, sort of uh, uh, examination. And I went through the document very quickly during this deliberations in the one or two days or maybe three days co conference. And at some point, I spotted that there was this almost unconditional freedom for the IAEA to go and visit any single building in any country. And then I asked to that person who was in charge of this as to whether this clause, this specific paragraph, would indeed give the IAEA the, the permission, the authority to visit, for instance, Ataturk's museum. Well, she was a lady, and she was, well, what kind of question is this? I said, look, say, I mean, today, Turkey and uh, you know, uh, the IAEA and the world, the Western world, all have very good relations. And what if, in 10, 15 years from today, there are strong suspicions about, you know, rumors about Turkey doing certain things wrong, and the IAEA wants to make sure there is nothing wrong, or wants to uh, sort of uh, see if there is any secret uh, sort of uh, activity, and then somebody uh, spread the world, uh, the, the rumor that there was indeed a certain amount of plutonium hidden in Ataturk's mausoleum. Would this give the permission uh, to the IAEA to visit this place? She said, theoretically, yes. I said, look, I mean, this is something that will touch the nerves, the very nerves of the Turkish people, and that will aggravate the situation. I mean, should the IAEA or, uh, no, uh, have the authority to visit you know, such places even? So this document, actually, depending on how you interpret it and how the agency would interpret or how the international community would interpret it, can give the permission to the IAEA uh, almost the utmost liberty, freedom to visit any place. And then, of course, uh, I suggested to, to the Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs by writing a memo, just you know, a, an official letter or something. Uh, I don't know how many pages I, I keep in my computer back in 1999, I guess, or 98, after this discussion with the person in charge of the document, and said, well, as you know, I always support Turkey uh, providing more transparency to the world, by, and that Turkey should become a member of the Nuclear Suppliers Group, the Zangir Committee, that Turkey should sign up with the additional protocol. But ha having this protocol out now, the text of it, there is such and such paragraph in Article 5, uh, uh, paragraph 5, or you know, A, B, whatever, I can't remember exactly now, I have to check this. And this may be, uh, of course, I'm not a legal expert uh, who would say this with most precision, but my interpretation and my understanding, based on my observations and my conversations, that this may be, become a problematic issue. So Turkey should put a reservation in its acceptance and uh, ratification of the addition protocol that such and such you know sensitivities will not be uh, will be observed and that you know uh, the, the the freedoms or the authority of the IAEA will not be uh, exploited for purpose other than really revealing any secret thing if there is any so uh, diplomats seem to be convinced but uh, Turkey uh, the parliament uh, as far as I remember uh, the necessary authorities uh, have signed and ratified without any reservation. And I hope this issue will never become a headache for Turkey in the future. Of course, provided that Turkey doesn't do anything, which is the case today, I mean, Turkey is standing with respect to nuclear non-proliferation and other non-proliferation uh, regimes, uh, elements, the treaties, conventions, and, and uh, all these uh, agreements, protocols, procedures, Turkey is in a very good standing. 
Still, there are certain uh, concerns, as we will discuss later on, uh, with respect to whether Turkey could or would like to build its own atomic bomb, because Iran, you know, has this and that program, or whether Turkey would be, you know, inclined to do this and that. I'm having very difficult time sometimes in convincing our, especially the Western allies, the United States, Europeans, who um, express their views, their concerns about future potential uh, Turkish policy, if and when Iran you know, uh, develops its uh, weapons, nuclear weapons capability. And what I'm telling them, as I always say here, and also uh, written in articles as well as in private conversations is exactly the same thing, uh, is that Turkey at least uh, for the foreseeable future, um, today's generation, I mean those who are in power in, in the government, in the military circles, I mean the Tur Turkish general stuff, the diplomats, academics, some of whom I know, and the bureauc bureaucracy, they may have in their own individual capacity different views about whether Turkey should or should not have nuclear weapons. But as part of institutional discipline and as part of Turkey's foreign policy principle, Turkey with this current situation at this time and for the foreseeable future, which means like 10 or so years at the least, will not, even if Iran develops nuclear weapon, weapons, Turkey will not go down the same path, down the same road because Today's generation of uh, executives in the government, in the military, in the in diplomatic and bureaucratic circles, they are quite aware of the very negative consequences of doing the same, of violating uh, treaty obligations, and that, that will be a very costly thing for Turkey. And it is not in Turkey's state tradition to um, do things in secret, in, 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 especially in terms of violating its treaty obligations. So, but still, they put they, they have a very lump sum view I mean they, and a, a whole sort of a, they see the entire Middle Eastern countries, including Turkey, uh, uh, as, as if they would all together would uh, go nuclear if Iran develops nuclear weapons. And then say, I say, look, if you have such concerns, then and if you if you believe Iran is definitely going to build a weapon, then your task is to find ways to stop. Iran's military ambitions. So, of course, provided that they are not uh, military ways and means, because this is not uh, going to bring anything uh, better than the current situation. So, uh, having said this uh, and made this remark, let's move on to the attitude of Russia with respect to Iran's nuclear program, because Russia is one of the key and uh, if, if you ask me, is the key um, actor, other than Iran, of course, itself, uh, who may uh, have this ability to put an end to this uh, confrontation? Because it, it has much bigger influence on Iran, not necessarily politically, because Iranians, I don't believe they are very happy, politically speaking, with uh, Russian, Russia's position or they don't seem to like uh, the Russians very much in terms of the, or they do not necessarily appreciate them. But uh, Russia has many instruments that may uh, potentially create much bigger obstacles for Iran from diverting uh, its capabilities from peaceful to military. Actually, Russia came into the picture uh, with this uh, contract. The deal was struck back in 1992, but the contract was signed in 1995. And how did Iran, uh, Russia uh, come into the picture? Because in the past, we, I mean, before 1991, December, there was the Soviet Union. And uh, throughout the 1980s, after the Islamic Revolution, just remind your, uh, remind you, refresh your minds, uh, Iran, uh, actually knocked on every single door uh, of every single country uh, which they believe or they hope would complete the unfinished nuclear projects, unfinished by the Germans and the French. They knock on the doors of the European countries, Latin American countries, Argentina, Brazil, and, and also Pakistan, India, 
all of them, and also Sweden, others. And, and first and foremost, of course, French and the Germans asking them to finish the job. And then under the pressure of the United States, none of these countries uh, actually uh, uh, was willing to finish the job. Not possibly on, uh, because of the US pressure, but for other reasons as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into this detail, and this is not important, it's not relevant that much at this point. And then at some point, uh, I think it was back in 1989 that Arsene and Gorbachev uh, had this meeting. And Gorbachev, in principle, agreed to finish the Bushi nuclear reactor, which uh, was left unfinished by the German firm KWU and Siemens. So then came, of course, this uh, Russian revolution, if it could be called a revolution. Uh, and Yeltsin came to power. And of course, uh, Gorbachev was in the position to help himself, let alone help Iranians in the nuclear project. So then, uh, after this uh, whole e change in the, uh, the Soviet Union, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Iran resumed talks with the Russians this time early, in early 1992. And then there was this agreement in principle. And then in 1995, uh, January 8, 1995, the deal was signed in Tehran during the visit of uh, uh, the, the person who was in charge of nuclear uh, energy in, in Russia was during his visit to Tehran. So then Russia came into the picture right to the heart of the, to the core of the picture, to the center of the picture. Um, one of the motivations for Russia might have been this uh, need for hard currency. Because when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was a chaos, economic, political, social, almost in every field. And w one of the things that actually that were missing was hard currency, cash, money. And the Russians expected to earn something like, a, a, some people say $800 million, some people say a billion dollars. So for finishing the job in Boucher, and instead of two uh, German reactors, Russians agreed to install two Russian reactors. So of different type, and that would require uh, sort of demolishing of some parts and reconstructing some other parts. So it was obvious that the construction of the Boucher reactor under the Russian uh, sort of uh, project would take much long time. Russians promised to finish in the year 2000. And look where we are now. They just finished this year, 2010, with some 10 years of delay. Of course, much of the delay, in my opinion, uh, emanated from this political controversy, not from technical or financial issues, like some people would assert. This is not the situation. Yes, there were some technical problems. There were some financial issues. There were some um, uh, problems related to who would provide the fuel for how long and who would uh, sort of deal with the nuclear waste. These were issues that necessitated further negotiations between uh, Iranians and the Russians. But the most important issue for someone like me who follows the issue for the last 15 years almost on a daily basis, I would uh, tell you with great confidence that much of the issue was political. And political because the United States and Russia, of course, have uh, very strategic relations from a very higher level. So of course, the United States told Russia on many occasions not to complete the job, not to finish the Bushehr project. And even if they wanted to do so, not to help uh, the Russians, uh, the Iranian scholars, uh, students who would you know, go to Russian institutions for earning their you know, PhD degrees. So the United States wanted to put pressure on, uh, the, on Russia just like they tried to do on the Europeans. But vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the United States did have much less, actually, both in number and also in substance, leverages. Because while on the one hand, Russia would have a, a much bigger, much important role in Iran's nuclearization, but on the other hand, the United States needed Russia not only in the Iran's issue, 
Iran's nuclear program issue because the United States needed Russia, especially for the non-Lugar program. The non-Lugar program, I think I mentioned this very briefly here once, uh, is something uh, that aimed at controlling the, um, the situation in the former Soviet territory. Because in the former Soviet landscape, in the former Soviet republics, there were many nuclear weapons, especially in basically in uh, four republics, Russian Federation being one of them, and of course also Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And there were large amounts of chemical weapons, chemical substances that could be weaponized, biological weapons and biological agents that could be weaponized, lots of uh, technical parts, technological parts and material, and thousands of scientists, technicians who were involved in the weapons of mass destruction production, manufacturing these weapons. So the lack of control, the lack of centralized authority on top of these republics uh, created a lot of concerns in the United States because everybody knew and uh, primarily the US intelligence agencies knew very well that some countries which were of great concern to the United States, such as Iran, such as Libya, such as Iraq, uh, even under sanctions after the first Gulf War, such as North Korea and others, were in search of weapons or weapon weaponizable material and scientists, technological parts, whatever. And there were many incidents of smuggling of nuclear material, chemical, biological agents, technological parts, and also scientists. So the United States aimed at containing the situation by creating a, some sort of a uh, framework uh, of co cooperation between Russia and the United States. And this cooperative framework was a cooperative trade reduction program known after the name of Sam Nunn and Richard Lugar, the two senators from the US Senate. Richard Lugar is still a senator and Sam Nunn is retired already. Um, so this Nunn Lugar program went all through the 1990s and still, of course, is effective under different names, Global Partnership Program, something like that. And um, it actually helped uh, the United States as well as Russian authorities contain this you know, spread of material, technology, and weapons uh, outside of the uh, former Soviet republics. So that was the biggest uh, and maybe the most important uh, concern of the United States and therefore the United States wanted to continue in cooperation with, the, with Russia. So therefore it could not put pressure on Russia beyond a certain limit because it was essential for the United States that Russia cooperate. If Russia did not cooperate, yes, of course, Russia itself might have been negatively affected from that, but the United States thought it would itself be more, much more negatively affected. So therefore, uh, US leverages against uh, uh, Russia were limited, as it is here mentioned, Russia's cooperation in the context of cooperative trade reduction initiative is essential for, the, for, for them, for the US, and thus Russia cannot be pressurized beyond certain limit to stop its cooperation with Iran. So, um, of course, again in the, in the early 1990s, uh, because the, uh, the, the, the trauma of the dissolution the, the of the Soviet Union some, was something to, to stay there for, for quite a while. I mean, it did not go anywhere overnight. And all throughout the 1990s, until Putin came to power and you know, acted as you know, someone who um, again mobilized the masses around himself uh, and, and you know, gave them this, this uh, morale to stand up and act again as a big power, superpower, etc. Well, of course, that has coincided not only with Putin's coming to power, but he was a, a lucky person in the sense that the oil prices have gone up you know, in, in a skyrocketed fashion, I don't know, uh, maybe tenfold. So Russia being the biggest supplier of natural gas and oil made tens of times of much more earnings and therefore um, than, than uh, the previous decade. And then in the 2000s, Russia was much better off economically and therefore politically and of course under Putin's 
sort of uh, statement statecraft. Uh, the, the Russian uh, uh, pol polity, I mean, the, 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 the administration uh, acted in a different way. But throughout the 1990s, Russia was, of course, uh, a country with thousands of nuclear weapons, which had this uh, deterrence against you know, potential enemies, actual enemies, rivals. And therefore, back in 1992-93, uh, they have revised their military doctrine and they have, in a sense, uh, scrapped uh, the, their uh, former no first use policy, which was uh, not to use nuclear weapons until the enemy used nuclear weapons. And then this time they said the exact opposite and said, even in the smallest conflict that may damage our interests, and not only in Russian Federation, but also in, in our immediate neighborhood, the former Soviet landscape, they implied that, did not necessarily this, put it that way, but they implied that if somebody else from outside meddled in the former Soviet republics, Russia's response would be with nuclear weapons. And they have revised their major doctrine, and they pronounced this near abroad doctrine, which actually, according to some analysts, and I tend to agree with it, uh, it was against, not against the Europeans or Americans, but against Turkey, because in the early 1990s, Turkey was seen as uh, spearheading into the, uh, the former Soviet landscape, seen from us as Turkic or Turkish uh, world, or the world of Turkish republics. So therefore, Russia was uh, feeling very uneasy about the situation. And it, Turkey was not the only actor which could do, you know, make things complicated from the perspective of uh, Russia. Iran was the other one. And Iran, especially uh, with its influence on Tajikistan and some other republics, you know, also Azerbaijan because of this Shia connection, Russia thought, you know, Turkey and Iran had to be somehow contained, somehow kept outside of the picture so that they should not you know, make things complicated. So this is my personal opinion. People might agree or disagree, but I have very good reasons to believe that that was the situation. And with the nuclear deal, Russia gained the leverage in its relations with Iran to control its ambitions to export revolution to Muslim Central Asia republics. Because Russia feared that Iran and that was actually a situation which was not only spotted, but not only observed by Russia itself. I might have mentioned this briefly uh, earlier. Um, United States and Europe actually provided incentives as well as encouraged Turkey to act as a model, as a big brother for the Central Asian and Caucasian republics of former Soviet Union so as not to leave the ground to Iran, because Iran, with its fundamentalist regime, from the perspective of the Europeans and Western countries, the United States, would not be the preferred model. And, but, of course, these republics could very well fall into the, uh, influence, under the influence of Iran. So Turkey was provided uh, encouragements by the West, and therefore much of the uh, impetus came not only from within Turkey, to you know, resuscitate our you know, historic ties with, with the Central you know, uh, uh, Asia and the Caucasus, but also came from outside, from, from the West. So the, the Nehru Abroad Doctrine, uh, in a sense, was taught to deter ambitions of Turkey and Iran, and also with the nuclear deal that Russia promised Iran to finish the uh, nuclear project. Of course, it had this leverage to use against Iran's possible ambitions. So in a sense, Russia gave Iran nuclear technology and in return for its promise not to do anything wrong that would damage Russia's interest in Central Asian republics. So this is something that must be borne in mind. Um, again, before going on uh, with uh, Russia, let's have a look at the situation. Russia is important in the sense that First and foremost, it is a member of P5. It is a country with veto power and without whose consent 
of course, together with the consent of all other uh, veto powers, uh, no decision can be taken against Iran, especially no uh, decision to carry out a military operation. And Russia, from the beginning, said this quite openly and explicitly, unequivocally, without leaving any room for you know, misunderstanding that it would never, ever uh, uh, um, agree to a military operation against Iran or its facilities. I mean, not only facility, but just some other show of force or whatever. And that uh, the whole question must be resolved diplomatically. And, well, of course, uh, it is something that you would expect from Russia because it is the main supplier of uh, nuclear technology for the time being for Iran. And it is not going to stop there because Iran has projects uh, to build again just like Shah had back in the 1970s, they, today's Iranian leaders and, and bureaucrats mention from time to time that they have this project still on their minds and that they will go ahead sort of uh, finishing the job and that they will have maybe 15, 20 or so reactors by a certain time like in the next 15, 20 years. And Russia is more than willing to sell many more reactors other than the one that you know, they just finished in Boucher. And it's just the first reactor. And Russia has plans to sell six or seven other reactors and maybe even more. And not only reactors, but also some other facilities. So therefore, how could Russia, on the one hand, sell one reactor or construct one reactor and uh, be a candidate for future reactors and, on the other hand, impose sanctions that would uh, prevent itself from selling this reactor. So therefore, Russia thought of its own, uh, from its own perspective and said, look, I am with the US up to a certain point because I don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. Yes, uh, Iran with nuclear weapons would not cause a big damage to Russian uh, interests. But of course, that would be the beginning of some problems between Russia and Iran. So therefore, Iran without nuclear weapons is in the interest of Russia because there are still some uh, Islamic uh, or Muslim communities in today's Russia, some uh, autonomous regions and uh, some groups which might turn their face to Iran with nuclear weapons. So therefore, Russia is concerned about that. And in the final analysis, it is not in Russia's interest to have Iran with nuclear weapons. But of course, Russia has to uh, sort of uh, walk on a very tight rope. It's something, is, is they have to strike a very delicate deal while on the one hand being the supplier of technology and also wanting to supply more in the future, but on the other hand prevent Iran from diverting this technology from peaceful to military and impose sanctions up to certain limit that would not damage Russia's own interest, but also prevent Iran from again getting uh, military capabilities. So it's a very complicated thing, but Russian diplomats uh, are quite skilled diplomats and they so far have fine ways of uh, you know, pursuing their own interests. But lately things have changed a little, little bit uh, and the Russia's sort of uh, tone of its voice uh, has just increased, beca became much louder and a little bit tougher. And this, in my opinion, uh, based on my conversations and my observations, because based on uh, the, the most recent uh, discussions between Iran's, Iranians and the Russians, last year about this time, or uh, autumn, or just late summer autumn, Russia and Iran discussed this, what is now known as the swap deal. The swap deal, as I explained a little bit uh, a few times here, um, for Iran, which had back then in uh, last year, in about a year ago, they had produced 1,200 kilograms of low enrich uranium, which cannot be used in weapons. For weapons production, you have to have more than 90% enriched uranium, which is called highly enriched uranium. And Iran had produced, although they did not have to do so, because they, they didn't have any running reactor, 
and even when they had this running reactor, which just started operation these days, Russia will supply the fuel. So Iran has no meaningful reason to uh, produce this fuel for its own reactors. But after all, this is their right, and they can use their right, whether it is uh, economically feasible or not. This is their problem to some extent. But then it becomes the problem of the United States, because the United States said, with this much of low enriched uranium, in a secret facility, you may have something like 20 or 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, which would be more than sufficient for one bomb. And since there was this cum facility, cum, in cum there was this secret facility, as I just mentioned during the first hour and also in previous weeks, Iran may take this low enriched uranium, the United States says, and take it to a secret facility like CUM, because the IAEA cannot confirm that there are no other secret facilities. And if there is one, and if Iran did this and uh, took it to that facility, this much of low enriched uranium is enough for 20 or 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. So therefore, the West pressurized on Iran to take this low enriched uranium outside of Iran because the West doesn't believe, doesn't trust Iran that this will stay as low enriched uranium, as peaceful, and it can be diverted to Mitri and it can be diverted to high enriched uranium in a secret facility, just like the one in the Kum area. So therefore, Russia, in order to solve this problem, conducted negotiations with Iran just last summer and end of summer, early autumn. And during these negotiations, Russia promised to take this 1,200 kilograms and in return for giving, it's not just because 100%, this is 20% uh, uh, enriched uranium for Iran's research reactor in Tehran. Because in the Tehran research reactor, Iran says they, their fuel is out, it's finished, and they need this fuel, which is enriched up to 20% of this much kilogram, for treating the cancer patients, for, because they will have to produce isotopes, which are used in the cancer treatment. And Russia says, and the West says, OK, you give me this low enriched uranium, this much in return for which I will give you a year later this much 20% enriched uranium that can be used in Tehran research reactor. And Russia was supposed to make this 1,200 kilograms into 20%, uh, 120 kilograms, which could be made into fuel pellets uh, in this core in France. So all these negotiations, technical issues, political issues, uh, were carried out in Moscow or somewhere in Russia, also in Tehran, in other places. And I understand Russia and Iran have come to a very close positions. But one day or the next day, Iranians said, we're not in. We walk out. This is what the Russians say. And then the Russians were really pissed off. I mean, you spend days and nights and on and off week in, week out. So you're, you're, you're working out a huge project. You try to sort of uh, provide Iran what it needs in return for also providing what the West needs. Get rid of this. That could be secretly weaponized. So, and then one day Iranians come and say, we're, not, we're out. We, we, we're going home. So Russia said, all right. I mean, you use me and you will, you will suffer the consequences. So, of course, these consequences have not been there as many people might have thought of. But Russia's position has become tougher. And it's tougher because uh, on June 9, 9 of June this, uh, this year, 2010, there was this UN Security Council resolution, 1929, which was voted and which actually envisioned uh, tougher sanctions on Iran. Not comprehensive, but you know, uh, to the point, uh, pointing at 
some of the uh, key issues, etc., which was uh, uh, n voted no by Turkey. I mean, Turkey did not vote for it and voted against. Uh, so this issue has become uh, the subject of much controversy and discussion, understanding, misunderstanding of anything. So we had to, again, explain the situation as to why Turkey did this and that. So therefore, uh, in this case, the Russian position was uh, somewhat uh, shifted from, if not very um, sort of uh, warm, but from lukewarm to a little bit cooler. Yes, Amelia. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, the question is about Turkey's initiative in the swap deal and how this was actually perceived by the other members of the UN Security Council or the rest of the world. Is this the question? Turkey, Turkey and Russia, how are they both viewed? Right? How are they both view Iran? I'm sorry, how do the Security Council members yep. view the swap between Iran and Turkey as well as the swap between Iran and Israel? Iran and Russia, I mean. Uh, Iran and Russia. Okay, now well, there is no swap between Iran and Israel for the time being. And may not be possible for the next uh, decade or so, at least. Well, um, first of all, there was no swap between Iran and Russia. There was these negotiations, which I mentioned, which have uh, been conducted quite intensively uh, for quite a long time, actually, for maybe weeks, months. And then the Russians thought they came to a point of convincing Iran to give its 1,200 kilograms of low energy uranium to Russia to make into a fuel and reach up to 20%. Then Russia would send it to France to prepare for the fuel pellets that can be used in the research reactor. And that would take about a, about a year. But then, as I said, if not all of a sudden, but at some point, Russian, sorry, Iranians said, okay, we're walking out. We, we're, not, we, we're not going to implement this deal. It was not signed. There was nothing signed. There was just negotiations. So this, of course, caused a lot of anger on the side of Russians. And then they toughened their, sanction, their, their position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran. But then uh, came, when this issue was, you know, uh, if not made public, but of course those who are involved, the IAEA and others, knew about this deadlock even between Iran and Russia. Then came this statement, this remark made by then Director General of the IAEA, Mohamed El Baradei, during a TV program in the United States on Charlie Rose. When, when I was there, I was always watching Charlie Rose, something very, very intellectually stimulating. And in, during this uh, conversation, he says, well, actually, Turkey can play a role in getting this fuel out of Iran. It could be stored in Turkish, on Turkish territory, in Turkish facilities, and in return for which the IAEA, France, Russia, and the United States, which is known as the Vienna Group, could provide Iran with the fuel. And when this issue, when this statement made by Mohammed El Barde, of course, Turkey said, okay, we, we, we are here to help, and if there's anything we can uh, help uh, resolve this situation, we are more than ready to do it. Then, as far as I understand, if I could follow, um, Turkey has conducted somewhat secret diplomacy or behind the door diplomacy, because in, in, in this kind of issues, you have to be very sensitive not to leak anything, not to give any impression to the world that you are doing this on that because some, there may be some provocations from outside and from within. So Turkey conducted secret diplomacy which culminated in the nuclear swap deal which was signed in Tehran together with Brazil, Turkey and Iran uh, on May 17th, which was later on turned down by the United States. 
And I discussed in the article, which uh, I show you a couple of times today, uh, that uh, was actually not a very clever decision. And I said this to whomever I see from the U.S. administration. Just last week, I said to someone also who, is, uh, who has an important position in this administration. And as I argue in that article in the built-in of the atomic scientists, in my opinion, there is no other way but to resuscitate the deal or not, no other way to uh, bring Turkey in this P5 plus 1, maybe another plus 1, P5 plus 1 plus 1. And this makes P5 too, right? <laughs> okay, and this one being Germany, and this one would be Turkey. Why not? Because it is important to note here, when you listen to the Iranians about what they sort of think they sent, or what kind of message they believe they sent to the United States, and then talk to the U.S. and Americans about what kind of message they believe they received for the Iran from the Iranians, you can see the huge gap. Iranians believe they sent a message to the Americans, and Americans believe they received some message, of course, through some statements made on behalf of some others, etc. And then you see that neither the message is sent correctly nor the message is received correctly. So there can come into play Turkey to bridge this gap and to bring the, the two sides together because it is in the interest of Turkey not to allow or not to let or not to give the United States the justification for any further sanctions or any military operation, this is for sure. And it is also essential from Turkey's perspective not to provide uh, the necessary pretext for Iran to advance its own capabilities even further because when the steel was not, I mean the swap deal was turned down by the United States and by the rest of the world, Iran said, look, I have my enrichment facility and I, have, I can enrich myself up to 20%. So Iran used this issue in order to advance its cap military, uh, sorry, uh, peaceful capabilities from 3.5% enrichment to 20% enrichment. Yes, small quantities. But another crisis and another, you know, no, another sort of controversy, Iran might say, well, I have to increase my capabilities from now where it is to this point. So every uh, such crisis situation provides Iran with the pretext or justification for advancing its capabilities. So therefore, Turkey does neither want the United States to use this for a military operation or tougher sanctions, nor want, wants Iran to use this for advancing its own capabilities, which are, of course, not welcomed by Turkey anymore, anyway. So uh, we will continue on Friday with the position of Israel. Wow, it's going to be very interesting next Friday. All right, I'll see you on Friday.